it's, uh, it's very nice to be here. Uh, as Neil said, I, I live in Jakarta, and we don't see sky like this in Jakarta. It's glorious. Canberra's a lovely city. You're very lucky if you live here. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about market-based measures. Um, but before I do that, let me tell you a little bit about myself. Um, yeah. I don't know. What I'm going to tell you is what I'm going to tell you, <laughs> which is it's all about the market, stupid. Um, that's the message that I want you to take home um, from today. I've, uh, this rather longer and more polite version is responsible markets can help save the planet. I was really hoping that Alan Oxley would be here today. Does anybody know of his whereabouts? He's not here. I can't see him. Um, anyway, here's the presentation. I'll talk about responsibilities, culpabilities in some cases. I'll talk about this uh, acronym, FLEGT, and the story so far. Um, and then some examples, some real live examples from the country I live in at the moment. And then, since this is uh, Outlook Conference, all about the future and what might happen next. But before all that, uh, me, I'm a forester. Uh, I've been working in tropical forestry for 30 years um, in Africa, Latin America, and Asia. And it's the last five years I've been in, in Indonesia, uh, which is where I've been developing this timber auditing scheme um, called the SVL car. That's actually a Malaysian tree, by the way. The Indonesians are very upset about that. <laughs> what I'm trying to do is stop illegal timber from getting into the supply chain, uh, going to Europe primarily. Um, and that means helping negotiate uh, a trade agreement with, between the European Union and uh, Indonesia. That means I'm based in Mangala Wanabakti, uh, the Ministry of Forestry in Jakarta. And as I say, my sentence so far has been five years, and I've, I think I've got another two to go before remissions. <laughs> before doing all that, I, I did look after trees, and here's a plantation that I'm at least partially responsible for in Cameroon um, with some Indonesian colleagues. Uh, this guy is still around. This guy, unfortunately, is in prison uh, for taking a bribe um, at some point. Some of you might know Neil Scotland, who now works for DFID, formerly in the employment of AusAid, uh, and that's me in the middle. Anyway, the thing about this photo, though, is to say that, that, that those trees are growing phenomenally well, but uh, I'm pretty sure they've all been cut down now um, because the people who used to live in that forest um, basically wanted their land back. This, this was an old forest reserve that the, the, the colonial French authority had taken from the local people, um, and they regarded it as theirs. And I think at the root of all of this work, we've got to consider who, <laughs> in Australia you should know, I guess, who fundamentally owns the land, um, and where that's unclear, then there's confusion and conflict. So back to uh, the presentation. Who is responsible for all of this? Well, in my uh, last 10 years, I've been working in the trade um, the UK Timber Trade Federation, um, and here I was, I was representing importers, buyers of timber from all over the world. Um, what was the amount that we used to bring in every year? It was, it, was, it was millions, it was about 10 million cubic meters, an awful lot of timber. And these were the sort of campaigns that I was having to deal with. Uh, NGO campaigns, that's Travis Perkins, that's one of the the big merchants in the UK, building merchants. DLH, one of the big international hardwood traders. Uh, and then this one, last one, is in the States. I didn't actually represent them. The point was that this was the reputations of those companies that was on the line. Uh, and they were starting to take responsibility for this. And I organized a meeting, um, I think it was in June 2003, uh, of the trade, invited over some Indonesians to speak about Indonesian illegal logging. And that very day, Greenpeace decided to unfurl this banner on a, a government building site in the middle of London. Now, as some of you may know, there was a government procurement policy in the UK at the time that said that the UK government would not purchase illegal timber. Uh, in fact, it would prefer sustainable timber. Uh, and so the point of this campaign was to basically identify some plywood that had come from Indonesia um, from a national park which, where it was obviously illegal. That campaign was called Partners in Crime, and it had several phases, and I was the brunt of those attacks. I had had to defend the trade, uh, the UK trade and their buying practices, uh, which was a very difficult time. I mean, I'm a forester primarily, and I got to say I had to agree with many of the things that Greenpeace had said. 
They went on after Indonesia to attack Chinese plywood that originated in Papua, in uh, the western provinces of Indonesia. This species, Bintangor, uh, after the first attacks on the Indonesian stuff. This was a load of plywood dumped outside the UK government to, to say, your policy's not working. So the government got it in the neck that time. And even Tony Blair was hauled up. This is Admiralty Arch, which if you know London, that's the mall, and going to the right is the Queen's uh, Buckingham Palace, the, the palace. Nelson's Column, the House of um, Commons. So it was a pretty active time for me, and it led me to uh, several trips to Indonesia, um, a country that's had its fair share of illegal logging. I think it probably last year slipped from being the most, the highly deforested country in the world in terms of the rates. But these are some fairly recent figures, uh, I think based on satellite imagery. Is the worst over? Is all the forest gone? Uh, is a good question now. And I think that's one of the reasons why the rates of deforestation have declined so much. So who is responsible? Well, government, of course. Governance, in the broader sense of the word, as well. It takes two to corrupt, uh, of course. Then there are the buyers in the supply chain. Do they really care? Does it matter that you are bringing in timber that's come from uh, a protected area where orangutans used to live? So the importers in the Europe and the US have said, yes, we are responsible. Uh, in that sense, I think the Australian importers have said the same, in the sense that they're supporting the, uh, the legislation in Australia. And end consumers have often expressed concern, although rarely paying extra for the certified product that the trade would offer. And the drivers for those are, indeed, things like transparency, media, and the IT. Uh, and in the end, of course, accountability is what matters. The NGOs have helped us in this. They brought some clarity to what's going on and connected the dots. And then there's the due diligence of buyers. And then, finally, at the end of all of this, I think the companies that I worked with in the UK, groups like Travis Perkins, were saying, it's our reputations. Are people going to trust us to do business with us if we don't know where the timber's coming from? It did help. There were a few pension funds that wrote in, in very stern terms, that they were unhappy with the performance of their investors, uh, their investment. And then, as I think Joe Ludwig said this morning, the social contract between business and society. Fleg T, my second theme. Um, what on earth does that mean? Who dreamt of that? Well, it was a conference, of course. Um, forest law enforcement governance was how it started, and in fact, in Bali, uh, in Indonesia, in 2001. And then the European Union added the T. And that was a really important addition, as far as I'm concerned. The trade is what has made this work uh, in practice. So it's, uh, it's actually an, an action plan um, that the, the European Commission orchestrated with the member states. Um, and it's now 10 years old. And I want to tell you a bit about it because it's a very unusual partnership between those three sectors, civil society, business, and government. And it's multi-pronged. And here are some of the prongs that influence, that are market-based. There, there are more, um, which I won't bore you with. Procurement policies. We started with those. And then uh, private sector policies took over the momentum, really. And now we're developing these trade agreements. And at the end, regulation. And I think that's a pattern that we will see uh, in more and more markets with more and more products uh, as the years stretch ahead. For us in the forestry world, forest governance is the aim of this work. Better forest governments, that, that means better forest management, that means hopefully less wanton deforestation. It doesn't necessarily mean less land clearance. Of course, countries need to do that still. So after 10 years, uh, what have we done? We've got procurement policies in the eight major markets in Europe. We've got six of these trade agreements agreed and seven more in negotiation. So there's Indonesia plus a whole slew in uh, Africa. Uh, we've got the timber regulation and the, pu the purchasing policies, which have now morphed into this due diligence uh, mechanism that uh, Paul t talked about. And here are the real things that matter. Uh, this, this report that Chatham House did a couple of years ago said that there was, there has been a drop in illegal logging uh, in Cameroon, Brazil, and Indonesia. And yet yeah, the volumes of imported illegal timber down 30%, 17 million hectares of forest 
protected from degradation, an awful lot of carbon, and that much revenue, 6.5 billion revenue saved from this work. Now, this is why I wanted to tackle Alan Oxley about this, because he came up with a figure of 270 million euros, I think, that we'd spent on this work. And actually, I think that's a pretty good return, even if all that money has just gone on those areas. Indirectly, it's affected what's gone on in Japan. Uh, they've got a, a, a timber procurement policy there. And now, at last, they're considering some further action of a regulatory nature. China is developing a certification scheme. Why? Because although it imports a lot of logs and consumes a lot of logs, it exports exports to Europe and the US, and of course, Australia. Then there's that legislation um, that we, we think we've helped uh, encourage our Australian colleagues, and of course, the US were first to, the, to the, the, the starting line with the Lacey Act and led the way on that. Independent forest monitoring has exposed the degree of illegal logging going on, and of course, uh, enforcement work. In fact, the Indonesian government has been quite successful in clamping down on illegal logging, particularly across the border between Kalimantan and Sarawak. And we know that because Sarawak ran out of timber about three years ago, <laughs> which is interesting. They deny there's any illegal logging going on and they're not responsible for this, but I'm afraid it's not true. So I wanted to give you a couple of, of meaty things to go home with, uh, and two examples from industry, both of course Indonesian. And this was another campaign, not related to uh, timber, but related to oil palm. Give me a break, Does anybody, is anybody familiar with this? Yeah, the Kit Kat story, and I'm really sorry, I had a, I, I had a YouTube link, but there's no internet here. Um, but basically, this uh, Kit Kat film, if any of you remember it, is about a bored office worker sitting there shredding paper, uh, and he decides to open a Kit Kat. Uh, and instead of opening some delicious chocolate, uh, it's, a, it's four orangutan fingers and he bites in, and the blood spews from his mouth. Uh, and it was actually devastatingly, um, the impact of it was devastating. Um, and uh, they aimed the, the, that at, at Nestle, which of course is the, the Kit Kat producer. But at the end of it was, was Golden Aggie Resources, which is part of the big Sinamas conglomerate in, the United, in um, Indonesia. The result of it was others stopped buying from GAR, so they pulled out of supply contracts, and they said, we can't afford this. Our reputations are too important. GAR, uh, you'll remember, if those of you following it, they got in auditors. They tried to defend themselves against this, but they gave up in the end because the, the evidence was irrefutable. They were responsible for destroying orangutan habitats uh, and draining deep peat. Um, as a result of this, this forest conservation policy was developed which, um, in a nutshell, through the, the good offices of the Forest Trust, was pretty far-reaching. No deforestation below 35 tonnes of carbon per hectare. That's actually pretty degraded forest. So anything less than 35 tonnes per hectare, you can deforest and convert to oil palm. But this was really important. No conversion of high conservation value forest or peatland. Um, that was really important, and I tell you why, because that HCVF and peatland is, is where people don't live, <laughs> and it's easy to deforest, and you get a whole load of income from the timber. So uh, this was a really big decision. Anyway, social conflict issues uh, have to be resolved, and then there's the certification scheme, the RSPO. My second example is even more recent. It involves, funnily enough, another company within the Sinar Mass Group, Asia Pulp and Paper. That's, the, I think, the biggest pulp mill in the world, in the Kiat, um, in Sumatra. This company has, by its own admission, now been responsible for mismanaging forests. The company itself has admitted that it doesn't know where its timber's coming from, uh, where the fiber that it's been using for this mill, and it was making commitments it couldn't keep. Promises to NGOs, to governments, to its customers that it could not keep, and it was being found out again and again. The level of trust, that social contract had been broken. Um, it was losing markets. And to, in my mind, because I was following it very closely, it was when Disney, Walt Disney, had a letter from Greenpeace that we, I think it was the beginning of the end for this company. Uh, and this was the sort of thing that, Green, that Greenpeace were demonstrating. 
that Disney was responsible for importing effectively ramen into the uh, products that it wraps its toys with. And the ramen, of course, is an endangered species. It's illegal to trade in ramen. Um, and so Disney stopped buying. In fact, they stopped buying from Indonesia altogether, which upset the trade minister, Minister Gita, some of you may know. Uh, and he phoned up um, the, the head of Disney. And Disney said to him, look, I'm sorry, I just can't risk it. It's too risky. Um, I can get my, my wrapping from other, other sources. So they stopped buying, and APP, I think, realized that it was the end. Uh, I, I'll cut a long story short, because there's much more to be said on it. But this is what they came up with. And you might say, well, why are we going to believe this now? What's the difference? This was last month. And the real difference is this fella here, the chairman, Tugu Wijaya, who is the shadowy head of this conglomerate now that his father is in his dotage, basically was there at the press conference promising that he would do this. Now, if you know Indonesia and the way Indonesia works, actually your word is important. It's your face. You've got to deliver on this. Of course, they'd worked out where they could get the fiber from, and they had help from the, the Forest Trust to do that. Uh, so they had a manageable solution to this. They no longer had to chop down uh, natural forest. They no longer had to cut down peat. But they, they took a big, big decision in delaying investment in a big new mill that they were going to put uh, in Sumatra. Greenpeace were there at the same press release. So there's your credibility. You've got credibility by working with the NGOs. And I think the real point from this story is that if APP can do it with its state of mismanagement, actually anybody can. And that's a really important message for the Indonesian government. Okay, thirdly, I want to talk about this SVL cut very, very quickly. Uh, this scheme is, if you like, the national response to all of this stuff. This is what Indonesia government has developed but at the behest of its industry in the end. Industry was saying, we need something to cover ourselves. Uh, we need to be sure, we need to be maintaining access to these uh, shrinking markets, Europe and uh, US. This scheme was developed uh, through multi-stakeholder consultation right back in 2003. Uh, I got involved in it right at the beginning, asking what is legal in Indonesia as a trader. We needed to know that. Uh, and then the negotiations started, and then they stopped, and then they restarted. It was classic trade negotiations. But the tipping point was the Lacey Act, the US Lacey Act. That's what brought the Indonesian government to realize that the markets were what mattered. Um, and then at the end of that year, in 2008, the European Union announced its intention to legislate. Uh, and as has been mentioned already, that legislation is now in force as of Sunday. So, uh, there we are with a scheme. How are they doing in rolling it out? Well, it's now compulsory on all exports for 26 different products. That's most of the timber that you would recognize when you walk into a builder's merchant uh, here in Canberra. And already they've issued some 10,000 licenses. That covers about 10 million hectares of forest at the moment, and so it's only partial. There's about 30 million in total, so 20 more to go. They're going to add more product codes, so that's going to be furniture added uh, in those 14. And then this timber trade agreement that we've been negotiating, we are hoping this will come into force in September this year. That's a trade agreement with the European Union, which says that the European Union will recognize this scheme. Um, and I'll talk to a little bit more about that. If you're really interested in more, there's a, a website there, Silk, uh, that you can Google. Uh, you can obviously get this um, presentation afterwards. But I wanted to talk about how the EUTR and the VPAs work together, because this is important. It's really important for Indonesia. And the reason they came to negotiate this timber trade agreement, which I think will have far-reaching effects, it's already having far-reaching effects on the industry, is because it means that when it's working, that Indonesian timber will be considered zero risk in Europe. You can buy it with impunity. Mark, his company, if he had one in, in the UK, would be able to buy that timber knowing he could not be prosecuted under the timber regulation. So these are basically bilateral trade agreements. Um, that's why they escape problems with the WTO, by the way. Um, it operates through a licensing scheme. 
which is basically governed by the border controls, so the customs at both ends. Customs in Indonesia check the licenses that are issued, and then the customs in Europe check that the same license is applied. Any unlicensed timber from Indonesia will be excluded. It will be left on the docks. It will be sent back, actually. Um, so um, the EU timber regulation requires the due diligence. Um, that's the difference. It doesn't, it's not a border control measure. And I think there's a slight difference with the scheme that Australia is proposing, because you, yours does Im imply, I think, border control. But we can talk about that later. So there it is at the bottom. VPAs give importers 100% certainty that the timber is zero risk. So the buyers love this scheme as well. When they're buying from Indonesia, they don't have to worry. They can just, they, you know, they can't get prosecuted under the timber regulation. Just at the very end here, I've been uh, in quite a fight with APP over the years, and I, st I just came across this blog in the Financial Times, written by their head of sustainability in Europe a guy that I've sparred with on quite a few occasions. Um, and this, I couldn't believe I'd read this. I thought, is this really true? The EU, through this approach, is helping to drive change. <laughs> Indonesia's largest business realizes that to become global leaders, they need to step beyond compliance. Wow, and, and here we go. My company, blah, blah, blah. Is, I, if I find it interesting that globalized trade, which has certainly contributed to illegal logging, may well paradoxically, also bring a solution. So basically, I think I'm here to congratulate Australia on its illegal logging prohibition bill. I'm to encourage you and say that there's lots more to be done. Um, we're in the European Union very keen to continue cooperation. Uh, and I'm, I've got some ideas as to what should happen. Wherever there are voluntary measures, I think regulation is the ultimate goal. Um, they are important in terms of innovation. The responsible purchasing policy that I worked on with the Timber Trade Federation is what morphed into the due diligence legislation. Um, there will always be free riders. There will always be the guys that think they can get away with it. So that's why you need legislation. Um, the monitoring that we see now all over the place, mobile phones connected to the internet, you cannot escape, you cannot hide. But this is really important. This is gonna be our next challenge, social conflict. Who really owns that timber, right? <laughs> Those guys that I used to work with in, in Cameroon would say, this, this is our forest. That was taken from us. That was, that's stolen property. Those trees belong to me, and I want the land to grow my peanuts. Fair enough. You can't really deny the person's right to uh, an existence, a subsistence. This sort of thing is, I'm afraid, going to be a big problem for us uh, in the rest of the tropics. Um, so changing behavior. That has been driven by markets, of course. I think the consumers with NGOs uh, were the start of this, but it's now governments that are taking this up with the support of companies seeking regulation. Um, those companies that want to be around for the long term, and I know a trading company in the UK that's now 250 years old. <laughs> They're in their 14th generation. They want sustainable timber because they want to be able to continue trading in timber forever and ever. Um, and this cut and run business, which I think was where Indonesia came from in the 70s and the 80s, I think that's, that's over. Partly because the forest is gone, but not only because of that. It's because the customers won't accept it anymore. And those elites that, we, that I see, the, uh, my, my kids are grown, grown up with in the school, are now moving into uh, the companies, into positions of authority. And in fact, it's the third generation of Wijayas in Sinamas that have said, enough's enough. Uh, we're not going to carry on this practice of, of basically ripping out the heart of our country. Kayu Lapis Indonesia is one company that uh, is a paragon of this. It's their, their third generation Indonesian. This is what they said recently in some business dialogues in, in London. We do what the customer wants. <laughs> I, mean, I know that sounds obvious, right? But believe you me, the Indonesian plywood industry, they used to set prices. Right? They were the price setters around the world. They could dictate what happened, and they would tell you what your sizes and dimensions and when you were going to get delivery. Uh, and that was because it was cheap, illegal timber. They, they flooded the market. So for you guys, yeah, it's very welcome. I'm really glad to hear that you guys are going out to explain it, and we'll, we'll be there side by side. If you want to join the market dialogues we have planned in Jakarta, you're very welcome. I think Australia is a regional champion. I mean, Japan is sort of doing stuff, but it's still very 
focused on its, on its own borders, and you've got to look at your footprint as a consuming country. Um, the relationship between Australia and Indonesia, you've mentioned it already, Paul, that trading relationship, political relationship, is very important. The Asian century. Um, but I think finally, I wanted to leave you with this one message from my colleagues in the Ministry of Forestry. They do, of course, want the SVL card to be recognized by you. I think they really ought to write to you and suggest that. <laughs> Not, I mean, you know, formally, like, please come and assess the SVL card. Okay, and, and I think that's a logical next step. It's effectively what the European Union did when we started negotiating the VPAs, the, the timber trade agreements. We said to Indonesia, do you, want, do you have anything to offer us? And they offered us eventually the SVL card. So I, I think this is an, a, a good next step. And then in your other international relations, of course, in the region with Japan, Vietnam, if they're important um, suppliers of yours, we can team up with you there. Obviously China, South Korea, I know, I know you don't do much with them, but again, we want to start talking to them. These are the guys uh, on the left. These are the first illegal loggers I met in Indonesia, in Kalimantan in 2003. And, and they're not doing particularly well, as you can see. It's a really hard job. Uh, they were just soaring up timber in the middle of a concession. These actually are victims of, of this business. They are basically working for the police for a peppercorn rent with awful conditions. And this lady here, who's uh, actually a, raising fish basically is another one of the victims because of course they lose out when the watersheds get uh, choked up. So that's the human angle but I've got to leave you with this of course. Thank you very much. <laughs>